Can everyone hear me? Okay, hey, um, my name is uh, Patrick Cullen. I'm a, I'm a network engineer at Facebook. And today I'd like to talk about building really scalable data center networks with low cost commodity switches. And for a change, instead of just talking about like we often do about what works for Facebook, I'm gonna talk about the broader use case for, for low cost switches and how we approach network design at Facebook. So before we go any further though, I'm gonna take you back to the late 20th century, uh, back to the early stages of my career. This uh, here in the picture, uh, what we're looking at are NCube 3 video servers, which were in 1998, they were state of the art for video on demand. Now, you gotta remember 1998 is a while ago for a lot of people. Uh, Netflix didn't start streaming video until 2007. So Netflix in 1998 meant you had to wait for the DVD to arrive first. Um, back then, going out and buying one of these meant you got a huge cabinet. You could stick it full of custom processor cards, which were lovingly designed by NCube. You get 64 cards into one of these cabinets. They ran a really proprietary uh, operating system called Transit. And fully stocked, you could, you could serve hundreds of concurrent MPEG-2 video streams. Now, these were magical in the day. These were fantastic pieces of kit. The only downside was each of them cost around $2 million US. Now, a couple of years later, when Facebook introduced video streaming in 2006, back when people uh, were still kind of sharing cat photos, but now wanted to share cat videos, we didn't go out and buy uh, an NCube 3 because in 2006, nobody was buying shiny magical hardware to serve video. We just got a bunch of Linux servers and we, we stuck them in a data center. And then we did what everyone else did. We went out and bought very expensive network chassis and we connected our racks up to these chassis. And that was pretty much what we did for years. Um, now, we realized two things very quickly when we did this. The first was these network chassis, they weren't nearly as reliable as the vendors would have us believe. So what was happening was we were pushing them pretty hard. Um, you know, video meant we were driving a lot more traffic out of the data centers than we had been pre than, than previously. And we were hitting a lot of bugs. So we effectively became beta testers for the vendor. Now this was great for the vendor. It wasn't great for Facebook. And the second thing we hit was as we were growing and we were growing fairly quickly, we were buying more and more of these big hulking chassis and we were spending astronomical sums of money uh, on network gear. So we took stock and we started to think about maybe we could take a different approach. Maybe we could take a similar approach with the network we had taken with servers, which was look to build out of commodity parts, look to make it cheaper. And so to do that, we traveled all the way back to the bleeding edge of 1950s technologies and we came up with an idea that really wasn't new. It had been around for a long time. And using these ideas, using these concepts, we designed our data center fabric. Now, this is a really simple network. It's three tiers. At the top, you have your edge pods, which connect the data center to the outside world. At the bottom, the server pods, that's where we connect all our racks to. And in the center, we have our, our spines. And this was great. This was a big improvement over what we had before. Um, it was much cheaper, it was much more reliable. And we started to think, you know, we should have done this sooner. And why isn't everyone else doing this? So it's not that hard. All you have to do is, you know, build your own network switch. And you can paint whatever color you like, because now you get to decide that. And uh, all you need to do that is you go out and you get a bunch of engineers who know something about hardware. They take a Linux server and they take a Broadcom ASIC or an ASIC from another commodity vendor. You stick them together, you got a switch. Now, hardware is not the only part of the problem. You've also got software. And in fact, software is actually a bigger part of the problem than the hardware. We found that out pretty quickly. And so we ended up developing a, what's now an open source operating system called FBOS. And we run all our, uh, our, uh, we run the software in all our commodity switches now. Um, now, the thing is, there's a reason a lot of people don't do this because when you start to think about it, we first have to go out and hire a bunch of hardware engineers who knew a lot about hardware. And then because we needed to write software, we had to hire a bunch of, hard, of software engineers. And this is our software team in California. 
uh, our hardware team is I think about around the same size. And these guys all work in Menlo Park. Uh, it's California, it's the Valley, so they all get paid big salaries. And before long, we were spending millions and millions of dollars on people. So it's true, a lot of companies don't have that kind of money to throw on network infrastructure. If you're not Facebook or Google or Amazon, maybe, it doesn't make sense. So that brings us back, what can everyone else do? Because, you know, again, Facebook, we often fall into the trap of thinking about what works for us and not, work, what, not what works in maybe a larger, uh, the larger world for enterprise environments. So the thing is, when we started doing this, when we built the proof of concepts for this data center fabric I talked about, we, we, we did the prototypes, we didn't use switches that we designed, we used vendor hardware. So the network topologies that we use can be done just as easily with vendor hardware. But before I talk about how we do it using vendor hardware, there are a couple of rules. So the, the three rules are, let's say, recommendations uh, that uh, we came up with are, are this. You have to run layer three everywhere, and that's a change for a lot of companies. Um, we found to our cost layer two, was a bear to work with. We kept running into problems with spanning tree and when it fails, it fails in a way that's hard to recover from. So you run into problems where you're trying to scale out to more spines, you're trying to use all the available capacity you have and with a, a, a layer two clause technology or topology, uh, that's not gonna work. You also have problems with TCAM exhaustion and edge switches, you have issues with broadcast traffic. So, so if you can, you make your layer two, layer three boundary, your rack switch. The second thing we, we, we'd recommend is run industry standard protocols, you know, especially BGP. Um, you know, very mature implementations exist from pretty much every vendor, highly interoperable, uh, rich support for ECMP, which is key. And the third is, is put in really big pipes, much bigger uplinks than you think you need. You know, big pipes are cheap now, they're getting cheaper all the time. And I mean, I, when we think about this, I think about what happens when I fly Ryanair. I fly Ryanair a lot because I'm pretty cheap. And when I don't fly Ryanair, I fly WoW. And WoW is even worse than Ryanair. So because I don't like paying baggage fees, when I rock up at the gate, I'm wearing a coat and my pockets are full. And that coat's inside another coat. And all so I can avoid paying a couple of euros. So my advice to you is, you know, don't do what I do. You know, let your pockets travel in style put in much bigger uplinks than you, than you think you're gonna need, you know, for years in advance. And I can't reiterate this enough, you know, you know, when it comes to layer two in a data center, you just gotta say no. And now in a lot of companies, you're gonna get pushback because there are gonna be teams that say they need to put all the servers in a VLAN, they need to span layer two across the data center for whatever application that, that they, need, they need to run. And it's hard. Uh, because maybe you're not the only one calling the shots, but what you can do is gently remind them first, it's not the late 1990s anymore, or you can look into using network overlays like VXLAN or NVG or E. So let's talk about where we'd actually start with our, with, our, with our topology. So where you could start is a really cheap commodity, one U, 32 port switch. Now the, the switch in the picture here is a Facebook wedge. It's not that new. Um, it's, it's still a pretty nifty switch. You get 1.3 T of throughput on the switch. And uh, even if you don't go with a switch like this, with a gray box, you can go out to, to any pretty, pretty much any vendor now. You can go to Cisco, you can go to Juniper, Dell. I think there's another company that makes merchant silicon switches. I can't think of the name right now. They will sell you a switch like this. They've been probably selling them since 2013. Uh, they're pretty cheap. They're about $200 a port now and getting cheaper all the time. And if you're feeling a little more spendy, you can go with a, a switch with a newer generation of Broadcom ASIC and, and make those ports 100 gig. But 32 ports isn't a lot. You can't do anything with 32 ports in a data center. So what you need is to build a virtual chassis. So here, we take six of those switches, we make two of them our spine or backplane, we make four of them our line cards, let's say. We stick them in a rack. Now admittedly, all I've done is double the number of usable ports. We only have 64 ports and we've, we've thrown six switches at it. But what we have now is we have a huge amount of redundancy. 
each switch can fail, doesn't take out the chassis. It's an individual point of failure. And, uh, and so you've already got a very redundant network. Now, you could maybe point out if somebody turns on the sprinkler on top of this rack, it's game over for your chassis. But the great thing with virtual chassis is you can stick them into two racks and you can put those racks at either end of the data center or in different rooms. The chassis itself has no idea that it's in two separate racks. The next thing we do is we attach some racks. Now, in this example, we could run four 40 gig uplinks to each of our racks, which is pretty good. And we can put 16 racks in. So very quickly, you can build out an aisle, an aisle of racks. Now, if we lose any of our line card switches here, we lose 25% of our capacity. So we're still pretty good. However, if we lose one of those spines on the top, that's half our network capacity gone immediately. So it's not ideal. But the thing is, as we grow out, as we add more racks, so let's say we go, we go beyond 16 racks and now we need, we need more. So we simply double our number of switches. So now we've got 12 switches here. We can support up to 32 racks in the data center. And now if we lose one of those spines, we're only gonna lose 25% of our capacity. So our availability picture gets better as we get bigger. Now, Facebook has these things we call hackathons. It's where we take a couple of days, we come up with some ideas. A lot of them are not great ideas, some are crazy. And we try to implement them, or at least a proof of concept. So things like video autoplay in Facebook that you might see or, or live streaming came out, of, came out of hackathons. Well, we asked the question, we said, how big can we make a virtual chassis? How many switches can we stick into a rack? And the answer it turns out is 40. So after you stick in your console server and your management switch in a standard rack, you can stick 40 of these switches in. So we did that. And if you do the mats, which luckily they're, they're, they're done for me here, which is great. You have 640 ports of rack facing, uh, you have 640 rack facing ports after you take out all your, your backplane connections. So that's a pretty decent chassis. That's uh, 26 T or so of, of, of throughput. And you've done this building, building your, your, your chassis with really cheap components. But the thing is, and it's true, I've glossed over a lot of details here. This is all, this all sounds great, but I'm, I'm kind of skipping over a couple of very important things. Fixed commodity, low cost switches are not the same as big network chassis. So we got a small little fixed switch on the left, simple, limited, limited controls. And on the right, we have our big hulking chassis. It's big, it's complicated, it's powerful. So, you know, we're not talking about the same thing. How can a fixed switch work as well as a chassis? And there are some trade-offs. When, when you use one of these switches, you're gonna have small table sizes because that's the reality right now. It means less room for routing tables, less room for ACLs. You're gonna have less packet buffer memory, which is not ideal. And you're not gonna have any fancy features. You're gonna have no redundant control planes. You're definitely not gonna have ISSU. So no in-service in software upgrades. So you're dealing with a fairly primitive switch in comparison to a chassis. But arguably, none of these, none of these differences matter that much. You know, in practice, in a data center, you know, routes are aggregated. So your routing tables don't tend to get that large. And ideally, if you're managing your data center and you've got some say in the matter, you, you steer clear of using ACLs and data center switches. If you can, you want to put your ACLs on the perimeter, either on the perimeter between the data center and the backbone or the outside world, or maybe putting them right on directly on, onto the servers because managing cumbersome ACLs and data center devices is hard at the beginning and it gets harder as you scale out. Oh, one very important point. I talked about big pipes earlier. The bigger your pipes, the, the quicker the quicker your traffic moves around, the less you're depending on, on, on buffering traffic. And, and you know, and buffering traffic, you know, it's it's the enemy, really. It, it means you've got non-deterministic latency in your data center and you don't know why. Because switches, although maybe we'll be told uh, differently later in, in, in one of the talks, switches don't really report effectively how much they're buffering and when. So it's very hard at times to tell which of your traffic is getting buffered. 
all, all you can see is your latency is increasing every so often. Now, I got to talk about ISSU. The moment you step up to the CLI and you tell yourself, I'm going to upgrade this switch and I'm not going to take it offline. And I'm 100% certain it's going to work. <laughs> so for me, you know, ISSU is not a feature. It's, uh, in fact, one of the advantages of what we're talking about here is if you need to upgrade your switches, you simply take each one out of service, you offline it, you do the upgrade, you bring it back online. It's much less riskier. And it means, in fact, if you want to upgrade all your switches, you simply, you simply iterate through the whole data center, taking out a switch at a time, upgrading it, putting it back in service, moving on. Each switch, each, each individual switch is such a small unit of capacity. Uh, you're not really impacting the network while you do the upgrades. Now, I want to touch too on provisioning these things because you're going to end up with a lot more switches than you had before if you go this route. And the biggest takeaway from this is to use uniform standard configs. So this is not a place for handcrafted, artisanal, gluten-free, extra hoppy batch configs. This is where you keep things very simple, very uniform. The second thing is if you can, you put all your configs in the source control. And the great thing here with source control is it means you've got one trusted location for all your configs. If you have engineers working on the data center and they're making, they're making changes to gear, they're going to end up with config drift. And then ultimately with config drift, you're going to end up with outages. And the other great thing about having all your configs and source control is when, you, when a switch breaks, you simply take it out, you, you, you throw it away or you orme it, you stick a new switch in and you get the latest copy uh, out, out, of, out of wherever you have your, your, your configs. And the third thing that's pretty important too is you build simple tools to take switches in and out of service through routing policy or, or whatever, whatever works for your topology. And when it comes to monitoring, again, you'll hear lots of people talking about monitoring and it seems to be this never ending uh, thing the industry you know, wraps itself up in knots talking about how to monitor a network effectively. Well, really a lot of it boils down to doing simple things well. Collecting SNMP, so getting SNMP counters off your interfaces, being able to look at graphs of what your switches are doing, uh, counters, errors on interfaces, that's key. The second thing is obviously collect all the syslog data into one place. There's lots of very good open source tooling for collecting and correlating syslog information. And switches tend to be very chatty and tell you if they're having a bad day. And then for the hard to debug problems, and there, there are those where switches are lying to you, they're telling you they're doing great, and, ha and at the same time, they're dropping half the packets to the floor. Uh, the only way here is to send traffic through your network and measure it. So that's always gonna be uh, um, something you're gonna need to do. And the last thing is when switches start reporting errors, don't even, don't even talk to them, just simply take them out of service. You can deal with them afterwards. Now, I want to step back for a minute. I've been talking about virtual chassis. I'm talking about putting switches into a rack, wiring them up, uh, putting switches into two racks and wiring them up. But let's think about the data center itself. The data center itself is effectively a virtual chassis. So look at this big picture that we like to shop around. This is effectively a chassis. You have your edge pods, you have your server pods, they're your line cards, and your spine planes there. That's basically the back plane of your switch. Now, we spend a lot of time talking about how massively scalable our design is and how big it gets. And that's nice and all, but it's not that interesting to a lot of people. But the one thing we don't spend a lot of time talking about is it also gets very small. So you can take this and you can boil it down to its smallest iteration, which is 12 of our low cost commodity switches. You put four in as your edge pod at the top, four at the bottom as your, as your server pod, and four spines in the middle. Now, this gives you up to 16 racks can connect into your, into your fabric here. You've only used 12 switches and you're starting small as you need. Then as you add pods, uh, as you add more racks, you simply add more server pods. You add, you add chunks of capacity at a time. You add four more switches every time you add 16 more racks. And then if you need more connectivity to the outside world, you put in more edge pods. This keeps growing in a very linear fashion. Uh, there's nothing, um, there's no step changes happening here. And then ultimately you'll notice you'll get constrained on the spine layer. And, and what you can do here is you can add more spines. Now, the thing that I haven't said is 
I'm a network engineer. I like spending lots of money on network gear, especially big, reassuringly expensive network chassis. I've always loved them. So there's still a place for them. You put them at the top where you connect the data center to the outside world. And this is where you do need sophisticated routing policies, perhaps large routing tables, traffic engineering, all sorts of stuff that chassis are really good at doing and maybe low cost commodity switches aren't there yet. Now, one thing I definitely haven't talked about, and this is unfortunately true, and there's no getting around it. You know, chassis might be virtual, cables aren't. So when it comes to this, there's a lot of cabling involved. I mean, and when I say there's a lot of cabling, it's a lot. In fact, if you look at our, our hackathon project um, here on the right, we stuck 40 switches into that rack. That's 32 data cables, two power, one management, one out of band. That's 1,500 cables in that rack. That took ages to cable up. That was not a great hackathon. <laughs> so what we learned very quickly is color coding is your friend. Not color coding the cables, you're going to have a bad time. And you need to let a lot of time, you need to put a lot of time aside in order to do this right. And uh, um, there's, no, there's no good way to do this. This is something we still struggle with. In fact, uh, Everyone, I think, struggles with sticking uh, cables into the right holes. And then I'll finish up with what, what's in it for you, because, uh, you know, I, again, I've been bouncing back and forth. Well, I think for that, we've got to go back to the NCUBE 3 video server at the beginning. Nobody's buying magical hardware to serve video anymore. We're all buying commodity servers, all of us. So I, I think the takeaway here is maybe we should be doing the same thing with, with our data center. Thanks. That's it, guys. That's we, I think we have three minutes, right? Three minutes, yeah. yeah. Um, so we have a question there. Uh, thanks, Patrick, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, my name is Victor. Quick question, and it's probably half of the presentation actually was about that, but I still get a, didn't get an answer. My, my experience, virtual chassis are really, really, really bad for your day in the small and the long run. Can you iterate a little bit more about why virtual chassis is better than more layers of claws? Because I can build claws with just four by four switch at any size of the virtual switch for the whole data center. It just will be a lot of you know, stages in there in the claws, but you know, who cares? And you're saying, let's make less stages, but more virtual chassis. Can you iterate more on that, please? I guess just to explain, what a, when we say virtual chassis, um, and I mean, I know virtual chassis has, has, a, has a bad name. Um, Juniper used it when they, when they uh, start, were selling the, I think, the x 4200s You could configure them in, as a virtual chassis. And I think anyone who's been in the industry a while remembers Stackwise. And the less said about Stackwise, the better. So. So when, when I say virtual chassis, it's really at a, at a loss for another name. Uh, what we're building effectively is a class topology, and we're using one rack unit, low-cost commodity switches uh, to do that. So, you know, effectively, we're building clauses with, with chassis and fixed form factor switches. This is using fixed form factor switches for everything. So the topology doesn't change. What changes is the gear we use. And when we put it together, when we build these chassis, we keep things really simple. So we're not adding any magical uh, tagging or upflows. Everything is done just using simple BGP. Uh, so there's no, there's no underlying protocol under the hood. So it, it's more about using form factor, simple switches, instead of using you know, big hulking pieces of metal with multiple, you know, multiple supervisors and you know, uh, fabric cards and so on. Um, but I think the topology is the topology. Uh, hi, it was a great presentation. Thanks. My name is uh, Rakesh. I have one question. So how do you cope up with, uh, let us say, a shift in the interface speeds? Like, as of now, if your commodity hardware supports 10 gigs, so one day it might come wherein we have to support 40 or 100, right? So you cannot change, like you build so many racks uh, till that date. So how do you shift and how do you plan for such a scale, maybe Facebook? 
Well, look, it's a great question and it's a big challenge. I mean, the commodity switch I showed is an older wedge. It's a 40 gig uh, switch. Um, and you know, now 100 gig tends to be the norm. I mean, the big problem is cable plant. So cable plant that works at the lower speeds may not work at 100 gig. So you know, nowadays it means putting in lots of single mode fiber, whereas historically you could get away with multi-mode fiber in the data center at the lower, at the lower data rates. And, and the other big issue, which I, I didn't talk about in the presentation at all, is, is the cost of optics. Now, optics costs keep dropping. Um, so, you know, ideally what you'd have is you'd have a lot of, um, you'd have a lot of fiber uh, in your data center, a lot of, a lot of single mode fiber. And then as you, as you swap out switches with newer generations, you don't have to necessarily replace the fiber, you simply replace the switches and, and the optics. But I mean, I think the industry is going to go more and more to, you know, embedded optics uh, because it's, uh, you know, it, it is a big challenge for everyone. So when we, when we iterate, we often have to go back and change all the, all, all the cable plant. All right. Thank you very much, Patrick. Awesome job. Great. Thank you.